Okay, welcome to Learning Stories with Abhishek Shetty. This is a show where we interview learners in the 21st century. Each individual profiled in this show has a unique story to share about how they acquired a set of unique skills uh, in a creative and innovative manner. In the process, we hope to uncover a new understanding of learning as conceptualized, narrated, and uh, imagined in these learning stories. Today's guest is Jatin Mehta. Um, Jatin's a dear friend, but uh, he writes about space communication and the moon, um, space exploration and the moon on his blog, uh, which is blog.jatin.space. Uh, I'm going to put that in uh, the link below so you can obviously read about it or read about his work after this interview. He's written so prolifically uh, about, uh, about space exploration and the moon that, uh, and he's, he's a reason I got interested in science again. So I highly recommend his work. He's a contributing editor, editor to Planetary Society. And uh, there are a long list of achievements. He's also published in a lot of global uh, news uh, outlets. So um, as if you go through his blog, you will find out more about him. I don't want to spend too much time on the introduction. Jatin, thank you for uh, you know giving us your time today. Um, I mean, I've known you, Jatin, as a friend for such a long time. So uh, this is really exciting to start off this uh, show with you. And uh, I mean, I, I thought I'd start off with a story, Jatin. You know, when I was younger, I remember somebody asking me, Avishek, what do you want to do when you grow up? And uh, it was, a, I think it was a family friend or an uncle. And I remember just telling that uncle that I want to be an aeronautical engineer or a <laughs> space scientist. And I had no That's clue nice. what... Yeah, I had no clue what these things meant. And then uh, I remember going into school and thinking, you know, I take up science uh, as I went into high school. But for some reason, I realized that I wanted to study science, not because I was intrigued by the field. I studied science because um, I wanted to get into a good engineering school so right. or get a good job. And I feel like this was not the right objective. But I remember speaking to you, the first time I remember speaking to you about, um, about science in general. I think we spoke about a lot of things. You must have given me a book by Richard Feynman. And it was just so different the way you spoke about science. And uh, just to start off, Jatin, and this was just a little background story, but can you tell us um, how you first developed your interest in science or where did you grow up? You know, just help our viewers understand that. Uh, where did you grow up and what was your uh, childhood uh, like? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's an honor and I'm very happy to be here. So to <clears throat> answer your question, how I got interested in science, it's basically a combination of things. First, um, I always liked science. I mean, just like any other subject, uh, more or less, with few exceptions. So it was mostly from my elementary school when we got first introduced to the subject of science. So uh, there were some interesting facts in there. And even as a child, uh, it was easy to get drawn to. So it, there was nothing particularly uh, remarkable about that. Uh, however, the fact that I got interested in it in the first place was interesting because not everybody liked those facts. So that was the first thing. And uh, later on during my uh, middle school, uh, the interest got uh, shaped a bit more and it was starting to take shape in specific ways. So for example, I got introduced to astronomy and uh, that's when I was completely blown away by, you know, planets in the solar system and the stars beyond and so on. And as a child, that was just crossing the limits of imagination that I thought I had. And that was just, and, and I could never recover from that to this day. <laughs> Uh, this so I mean lots of things are interesting in the world and but to my mind in particular in uh, you know to my mind personally there was nothing that crossed the limits of imagination just like anything as uh, no anything even remotely as strongly as space exploration did right. so that was my introduction to space exploration and but to be specific the the story that caught on uh, you know the, so to be specific the most important uh, aspect in the development of space exploration in my life early on came with my uh, school 
omitting certain chapters of space exploration from the science syllabus. So they omitted uh, chapters related to the solar system typically. Uh, they did it for three years in a row straight. And I was surprised by it, but somewhat also not caring for a while. I was like, okay, let's, it's just less work to do, less, less stuff to study. So I was more or less happy just like any other child. However, uh, once they did it for the third time, the curiosity got better out of me, uh, got the better out of me. And I was like, okay, let's check what they have omitted. So the next year, uh, I took to myself to just read the chapter anyway. And um, uh, even before school started and just like, like right in the vacation period. And uh, so I just read about the chapter. The chapter was called The Universe. And I was blown away. And that was the hook. And um, so I was like, why did they omit this all the time? But then in mm -hmm. retrospect, it's because they omitted it, probably it, uh, gave me more of an incentive to check it out. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, so that was basically what my uh, introduction to science was like. Apart from that, in terms of experimental science introduction, I had none. Mm -hmm. uh, my school was just like any other school. We did not have any special emphasis on you know, learning by experimentation. We did not have fancy labs beyond the basic ones uh, or a special time allocated for students to do whatever they want in those labs or anything like that, the sort that you have now for many schools. So in that sense, uh, a lot of my introduction to science was via textbooks and books that I could find in the library that is there for kids in the neighborhood. So yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I actually, so was, I mean, Jason, I remember you, telling me about the library and that that's such an interesting space because a lot of times you know young children are exposed to books in their local libraries i know growing up in yeah. india we don't have a very good public library system but that's something that would be really nice but uh, there was a story i remember you telling me about uh, life about your dad taking you to this particular library and this was the first time you were exposed to sort of books that were so diverse yeah. and there was a reasonable collection, but can you tell us uh, about this particular library and maybe uh, a, a book or two that really got you hooked to reading uh, about science in general and maybe the space, maybe space in particular? Uh, right, so, uh, okay. So the library uh, story goes something like this. I. After I got intrigued about the universe from the from reading the textbook, I was not sure where to find more information. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the thought that my school has a library did not occur to me, to be very honest. Uh, and so I was just uh, trying to tell dad, you know, I'm, I just like this very much. And what should I do? Like, I want to learn more about this. <laughs> and he told me to just take a bicycle ride around my neighborhood, just go a kilometer or two and just look for libraries that are there in the neighborhood and so i looked for them and i got a couple of them but only one of them was uh, you know fancy and had a good collection of books and uh, to top it off uh, to 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 put cherry on the top it was called planet kids and uh, they so it was a library for kids and uh, of you know of uh, school uh, yeah for schools uh, mostly uh, high schools and middle school and the just start just and for kids who are just starting school so it was a library for kids and i found a lot of space books there mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, uh, on topics which were just starting to introduce me to further uh, things in space exploration beyond what i had already re read in the textbook and so there were top things like i don't remember specific books but i do remember that there were books on planets mm -hmm. and that was about the same time where when Pluto had been demoted uh, by the astronomy community from a planetary status to a dwarf planet. Oh. So as a kid, that was interesting. Like, how can something just not be a planet anymore? <laughs> I mean, so, the, so there was that. Uh, so there were books on planets. There were uh, books on life uh, in the you know, life in space for astronauts, uh, for instance. So that was also pretty intriguing. And then there were books. There was one book on the Hubble Space Telescope and what it had found in the universe thus far. Mm -hmm. So there were some really pretty pictures in there and uh, information to go along with what those pictures really meant anyway and uh, things like that. And as I grew a little older, two or three years into that, so I had, by that time, I had consumed all of the books in that library. 
and uh, so uh, I was looking for something more. And at that time, I realized that the uh, uh, the uh, the people in the neighborhood who get all these uh, what do you call it uh, these used books, right? So used bookstores and used magazines and stuff. So I started going there because I I uh, I was just looking for something related to space that I could find, and then I stumbled upon a Scientific American issue, and uh, uh, that that was my introduction to Scientific American. I did not know it existed before. I just saw a picture of something related to space on the cover of the magazine, and uh, it looked intriguing. So I picked it up, and the level of detail in which Scientific American goes into obviously is incredible. And so this was I. This was the time when I had just entered high school or junior college, as people in India refer to it. Uh, so I I just read some of those stories and it blew my mind. So the next thing I started to do was uh, look up more magazines of Scientific American in these used stores because they were cheaper than the actual copy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so so I just started reading more of them, and then that cycle began basically. <laughs> it's so interesting because you're sort of hustling to get access to knowledge and and, and you were yeah, so yeah. intrigued by the field that whatever information came, you were sort of trying to consume it and take it in. But it's so interesting that your dad was so supportive. And, you know, I'm just curious about the role of your mom and dad in uh, supporting your curiosity. So, for instance, this was one story where you told your dad you were interested in this and he recommended that idea but do you remember other instances where both your parents were supportive and can you help us understand a little bit about their influence on your eventual path yeah so basically there uh from, from what i understand about their support is that first of all it's it's been mostly uh it's always been there in the background mm -hmm. and so it's been something that it is something uh, very reliable that you just know is there so you don't have to think about it per se. So in specific ways, it meant that uh, starting from the suggestion about the library to going to one larger library uh, ourselves to pick up a more, you know, uh, uh, a more exhaustive book on astronomy and space so that I could learn it in proper detail uh, to uh, giving me access to any possible related resources that I could need to, you know, learn more about space and uh, to take up science in my junior college as a formal education option mm -hmm. so that I could pursue science further. So that's basically, uh, it's just always been there. So it has never stumbled. And uh, that's, uh, so it's it's hard to remember specific instances because it, it it's just always there. So it's like, yeah. you know, you start taking it for granted in some ways, uh, to be very honest. Uh, so it's sort of like, you know, air, you just assume it's there. So. Yeah uh yeah so that was that so and to this day it's been mostly the same i mean their support is there through any career decision that i make so from right from my early days in exploring uh you know learning about space to the education part to uh my profession right now uh it's just been consistent that's that's it's very interesting to hear jatan you know because often they say that uh when you have a parent that has uh taken up or studied science themselves, it does help to uh, encourage the child. And sometimes parents that are in STEM professions often push their, their children to. So did you feel like you had that sort of environment growing up? Or do you think that's even necessary that a parent must so, have, or, you know, or even if it wasn't your parent, was there another friend or a uncle that- so, yeah, so in my case, it was actually not the, not that particular instance because uh, my parents are not from science, technology, engineering, or mathematical backgrounds, and uh, so they were just uh, wanting me to pursue for the because uh, you know they, they were just happy to see me pursue what I liked, mm -hmm. and so they did not have any background of their own, so they did not know exactly what I would do, what I could do next uh, beyond you know just basic things that they could figure out for themselves. So, but once I figure something out, like, you know, with once I get access to some information from somewhere, they were happy to enable that basically. Nice. But I, I would imagine it's certainly different for someone who has been born and brought up in a, uh, you know, uh, in an environment where the parents are themselves from science backgrounds. 
so that I would definitely assume that it would be different, mm -hmm. at least in terms of the information available. So in my case, uh, it has always been and it continues to be the case where since I have no one in the larger family from such a background, like mm -hmm. in the entire larger family, I'm pretty much the first one to have gone into science um, mainstream. Okay. Uh, I mean, sure, there have been some engineers who then went on to, you know, uh, start their own businesses and stuff, but it's not particularly STEM. Uh, so in a strict definition of it. Sure. So, uh, so they're not doing anything in STEM specifically. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, since I did not have access to any of those information uh, and resources readily, mm -hmm. uh, it has always meant that I need to figure out uh, uh, information from somewhere else and yeah. from someone else. Uh, and in that context, the uh, getting access to people, once I figure out that, you know, where do I need to go or what do I need to do, the parents have been very helpful. And the other entity that has been really helpful is the internet. So, I mean, we take it for granted now, but uh, in uh, when I was in school about, you know, this is when 2006, 2007, mm -hmm. uh, internet access was there, but not, not, you know, it was not as ubiquitous as it is now. It was not as easily accessible, not as fast, but it was just as important and it was just as useful uh, once you do get, <clears throat> do get access to it. So, yeah, so that's been pretty much the case. That's, yeah, that, I mean, uh, you make me think about how the internet has actually removed a lot of the barriers that people would normally face to access information about a particular field, because now you can basically access knowledge that you want, that maybe someone that was growing up in the 60s or 70s or even earlier would not be able to access. So even if you don't have like a parent or a, or a family member in the field, you can connect with the best minds in the field and as your relative, I mean, they were in an engineering field, it's still STEM, but, you know, that's what I want to understand that, you know, you chose like, uh, like when you went to university after high school, I know that you've done your bachelor of science in physics, right? And then you did your master of science in physics and that's five years of focused study. So what motivated that decision to study more foundational science rather than take a more applied uh, discipline like engineering because I know there's a tendency for a lot of young people you know growing up in our context both of us grew up in Mumbai to take up engineering as a field of study if you do end up taking science so what shifted I mean what were some of the reasons you decided to study physics as a subject and and what was that so, experience like for you? So for me it was a very easy decision because uh, as I said since I was interested in space exploration and I took science in my junior college my next goal was to figure out uh, how to become a scientist who studies space exploration, studies space, mm -hmm. and who tries to figure out, you know, uh, how uh, the universe works and, you know, what a particular star is doing and what what do planets have inside them and stuff like that. So, uh, so the idea was very simple that, you know, I need to, I want to study space as a profession. Back then, that was the idea. And so what do I need to do for that? So after some searches on the internet and stuff like that, I figured out that you need to do pure sciences mm -hmm. to be able to study, uh, in particular physics, to be able to study astronomy because astronomy relies on physics as its foundation. So that was the decision that led to uh, pursuing physics in my bachelor's and then subsequently my master's. So. Yeah, that was a pretty easy call uh, in, in the larger context. The harder part was to figure out that I what do I need to do specifically and that what turned out to be bachelor's and master's in physics. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, that, and I had, uh, apart from uh, an interest in engineering, I had an interest in engineering. I still do have an enormous interest in engineering from a perspective of gaining knowledge about it as to, you know, what do they do? Uh, how does it affect other things? Uh, what are the limits of engineering? How do we have advances in that and so on? But I had no interest in, and still have no interest in pursuing it as a profession. That is, I don't want to become an engineer. I want to use engineering as a means to do science. So, and that's what a lot of my space exploration writing is also about. Uh, I do touch upon technology of space exploration, yeah. but in the context of how is it enabling science? Mm. And so that's the context. So yeah, so basically that that 
that idea has always stayed that you know pure science is the motivator and the driver that's that's pretty interesting jatin because i'm i'm thinking about the decisions you have to make at this point of time right you're trying to think about a profession you can take up and and the most uh, the path that's normally laid out for you is that of a scientist and um knowing you today i know you did not take that path but i'm thinking about were there some experiences at university like one of the things you would tell me about was um going to these uh, star gazing events and that was an interesting sort of uh, curiosity for you you also were part of a group of young people that used to organize these uh, these uh, i don't remember the name but they were called lecture camps or word camps or sci camps and you would you would actually yeah. do like uh, rec- lectures on random science topics and you would co host them in a lot of ways and also uh, we were part of like a little circle called the learning circle so i'm just thinking about were there experiences like this that you know pushed your thinking with regards to space exploration even within the university system and beyond right right so yeah so that's uh, that's been one part of where my shift to uh, science communication from trying to become a scientist came into be however the major shift was even before that uh, was when in my high school after my high school actually just before i started my bachelor's in physics i was introduced to uh, writing on the internet as a blog uh, on a blog by my cousin and so he showed me blogger which was popular at the time and that was my first introduction to blogging and i was completely blown away because i was like okay you can just start a blog here for free and you can type stuff out and it will get published on the internet and everyone can find it google can surface the result if it finds it relevant and so on so that was a very powerful idea the fact that you can just you know publish something from your couch and have it instantly readable by the entire world as long as they can access it or find it mm-hmm. uh, that was just a beautiful idea and i was hooked to it so <coughs> i started blogging uh, long back so that's about 10 years now almost so i started blogging i was doing that on and off even when i thought i was you know even when i wanted to become a scientist and i was pursuing bachelor's and masters in physics uh, i was blogging on the side and as and when i got time as and when i could you know churn out articles just out of interest not to you know run a blog with x amount of followers or to have any goal to that just because i like to write mm-hmm. and i like to explain what i learned in those classes in bachelor's and masters yeah. so if i learned about uh, uh, you know uh, quantum mechanics or if i learned about astrophysics then i would like to write about it and that's also where these ideas which you mentioned about you know trying to host lectures in the city and uh, give lectures myself and uh, go to sky observation sessions where i would uh, explain people about the stars in the universe and give talks and also learn more things myself and so on all of these were part of the outreach which i inherently like to do but did mm-hmm. not realize it uh, until later in my after my masters uh, long after my masters actually so even after my masters got over i was still thinking about becoming a scientist primarily mm-hmm. and as my profession and what and, what was uh, your masters uh, research about jatin so yeah so my masters was in physics but and uh, after i completed my masters i did a research project in astrophysics for one year okay. to get a sense of what research looks like okay. uh, in in practice okay and, i'm just uh, curious because so, i think there are a lot of young people that would be interested you know in terms of how uh, maybe at the at the graduate level you have to be a lot more specific so if you could just you know help us understand some of that that would be great just very briefly right. if that's so, possible yeah sure so uh my astro my research project was in astrophysics which i did uh, uh just after completing my masters specifically it was about the idea in astrophysics is basically to take any natural phenomenon uh let's say a particular type of star mm-hmm. uh and whatever it does let's say it emits x rays and so the idea is you study those x rays and you try to figure out what exactly is the mechanism that generates those x rays mm-hmm. similarly uh 10000 objects will have 10000 characteristics sure. so every astrophysicist will try to pick up a certain aspect of it or some overarching theme about it 
and then try to understand those details uh, via research and data and so on. So in my case, it was basically about, uh, so there's this telescope, space telescope called Astrosat. It is India's first space telescope. Okay. It was launched in 2015 and it is still orbiting Earth as we speak. Sure. Uh, uh, so my project was about uh, studying X-ray data from that telescope about a particular of a particular star, uh, which I would analyze to figure out what is exactly going on in that star that it is emitting such intense X-rays. Mm. So basically, the yeah, so that was my research project, uh, so which I did in 2017, so not okay. long ago, and uh, while I was doing that, I was also blogging on the side. Okay. Um, so. So I was that, blogging I mean, on Medium at the time. That's, that, that's a good segue into the blogging question, Jatan. You know, I feel like that is such an important part of your life and your journey. And what's interesting is you kept blogging through school, through university. And how did this shift happen? Because uh, when you start off on Blogger, do people just come and read your work? Or did you feel like there was another medium that gave you more readers? And how did you reach out to other people in the space exploration community to come and read your work. So I want you to sort of share like some insights into that process. And, and also, yeah, maybe just talk about your writing for now. That would be really helpful. Right. So that's a very interesting question. I, I, I didn't think about it that way, to be honest. So that's yeah. very interesting. So the idea was, uh, okay, so when I started blogging right after high school, for the for about five years or so, or more, in fact, uh, yeah, so about for five years or so, I was just blogging out of my passion and just because I wanted to write about yeah. what I, just because I wanted to write about what I had learned. And <clears throat> so the, there was, the, I did not have any major audience. In fact, I remember specifically that at that time, my the best views that I had gotten uh, per day uh, in those entire five years was about 100, I think. And I was very happy about that. Like I was rejoicing about that at, on, on one day. So most of my audience for five years was just friends and people I could find, uh, you know, physically most of the time, uh, whom I knew personally in some way or the other and were interested in science or were my friends and not interested in science. <laughs> uh, but how many so articles just, you wrote in that period, Jatin? So, um, I, yeah, it should be about that, but I don't remember explicitly because it was more like I would just write whenever I felt like. But, but would you and, think that just, time, just just to, you know, I'm just thinking, was that time sort of your writing school where we, you were refining your your ability no, to communicate? No, so, no, no. So, I okay, I, I, I think I got your question. I'll, I'll yeah. come to that in a, in a bit. Sure. So, for these five years, I was just writing for fun and I, I did not have a large audience. And Blogger gave me some, since I was publishing on the internet, and I was sharing on Facebook and Facebook groups and so on. So occasionally I would get like 30, 40 extra people and so on. But then in 2017, right when I was doing my master's project mm -hmm. uh, in uh, about uh, uh, the astrophysics project, which we spoke about, I, uh, I started writing on Medium because Medium was getting popular at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's medium.com. And uh, I it was getting popular at the time. So I just shifted, uh, I just started writing that it, it seemed more modern than Blogger. It had better features and so on. So I that is the time when I started writing more regularly and with an audience in mind, because by that time I was on Twitter, I was on Facebook and so on. So I was like, okay, let's, uh, if I'm writing anyway, why, let me share it with the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, the interesting thing that happened is social media did not give me a significant uh, uh, audience in terms of volume, Medium did. So wow. since Medium was getting popular at the time, uh, every time I hit publish, I would just get a thousand views or so the next day. And really? that was incredible. And I started getting followers also. And I think in about uh, seven to eight months, I crossed 5,000 followers on the platform. And uh, I had not anticipated that, nor had I, had I planned for it in any way. <laughs> It just happened because the platform was growing to be very fair. Very so it was partly my writing that I was writing, you know, uh, uh, regularly. Mm. Uh, and the fact that people happened to find it interesting. Mm. And it was partly the platform who was seeing a surge in readers at the time. So com those things combined gave me more exposure. And that is when my first break into professional writing happened 
is when uh, so medium was getting popular and that team indus a space company a private space company based out of bangalore uh, they also had their blog on medium so they were writing about what their space mission was about on medium and <clears throat> and their marketing team came across my blog since i was also writing on medium and they thought that you know this person is also in india so let's give him a call so mm -hmm. they called me and asked me if i would like to join their marketing team to uh, write about their space mission for them oh. and so that was my first uh, professional break in writing uh, wow. so i obviously said yes and i went there to write about uh, the space mission and space exploration in general for them that's i mean i mean i just want to pause here jatin you know because you make it seem like it's really easy but what's really fascinating about this is that you basically got your own job by writing on the internet right and that is yeah. something a lot of young people don't think about that you can actually reach out to an audience and uh, mm. create some value on the internet and that can actually open up so many more opportunities for you because i'm sure there must have been somebody on that team that read your blog and they thought that maybe the same writing would be useful in our context too right so right. like what do you think was different about the way you wrote chatan you know because everyone writes on medium right why do you think your mm -hmm. writing got so much attention and is there something what is your like i mean you don't have to share like the finer details but what's your like magic recipe of a good space science uh, exploration article uh so do you mean now or do you mean at the time when this I, I, happened i mean i'd like to re i'd like the listeners to know about your journey jatin so preferably at that time and then we can come on to okay. what it is now so i think at that time based on what i know about writers on medium at that time because i was also reading about space from other writers on medium and with the exception of one writer who is like super popular and uh, and so on with the exception of that writer i think uh, uh about my writing if i were to say it myself then i think it was two things one was uh breaking down complex concepts into simpler parts that's mm. where my physics uh, uh you know education basically came into effect so it was not like you know just because i became a science writer uh, now means that my education was useless because it is precisely that uh physics graduate uh, you know bachelor's and master's degree that has helped me understand complex concepts so that when i come to my writing uh of any topic i can explain that complex concept in a way that is palpable to other people mm. because if i need to understand it myself so the understanding of complex concepts one which then i tried uh, made effort to uh, put it into simpler terms sure uh, so i put effort into that so that was one part and the second part was trying to find really really good images uh at the time which i thought no one else was doing so so that you know people can click on that and get appealed by those images and so on so uh and since i could explain those images also right you know it was not like i'll just slap an image on your face yeah. it was like i'll slap this image and then i will explain you what this image is so uh so yeah so i think it was a combination of those two things uh in my opinion that uh made me separate you know that gave me more popularity on medium compared to other writers with the exception of that one popular writer who is ethan siegel oh, okay and, uh, i have learned a lot from him so that's that, that's really interesting jatin i think the point you make is so important right that education is so important in a formal setting because it gives you the foundation from which you can go on to any uh you know because that those five years at university actually gave you such a strong grounding in the uh fundamental elements of the subject that you were able to apply it in different contexts in a way that was suitable to you right so and that's something that i also want to you know push forward as an idea is that just because you want to you know uh do something innovative you don't have to you know drop out of school or you know start a company you can actually you know get 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 your education go to university and then once you have that knowledge actually find ways to apply it in the world in a very unique way so thanks for sharing that insight with us chatan and also i think you're very humble about this you know and i've been reading your blog for over 10 i think 6 i've known you for about 10 years now right jason i think at least i uh, know i think eight. i think no no i think uh, it's about 7 years yes 7 7 yeah i think 2013 yeah. or so yeah somewhere around that time yes yeah but it, 
I think what I always enjoyed about the way you spoke, Chetan, is that, and I've seen you evolve over time, right? But I feel like you have this skill of making something very complex seem very easy. Like, for instance, when you spoke about your master's research, you know, you just, you made everything seem so simple that, you know, these stars emit x-rays. I mean, it's obviously a lot more complex in the technical terms. And then as astrophysicists, you study those, the properties of those x-rays. So it's, it is not as simple as that. And, and, and I think that is a real skill. And that's something that a lot of, a lot of students really want when they're in school, you know, because if you think about the stars and you think about the universe, it's all us, right? I mean, it's just so beautiful to look up at the sky and be like, planet Earth is not just the only planet in this solar system. There are so many other planets and these planets, right. you know, move around stars and and it's just so fascinating. And I feel like, thank you for, you know, making things so simple through your work. And obviously this interview is, does not do justice to your work. And I recommend that all the listeners actually go and read all of Jatin's wonderful articles He's obviously progressed a lot since that time. Uh, but just coming back, you know, retracing, I, you. I was just, you know, I just wanted to bring this point up that that you have worked really hard on your writing for the last seven, I mean, five or six years. And it's not just come up overnight. So uh, thank you for your work. Like about your writing, Jatin, like, yeah. Like from medium, right? Because... I mean, you are out of university and you're looking for a job, right? You you did start working at Team Indus. And uh, yeah, was Team, can you give us some background about Team Indus, if that's okay, like the work they were doing and the work you were doing there and for how long you were with that organization? Yeah, sure. So basically, Team Indus is this private space company based out of Bangalore. And mm -hmm. when I joined them, the idea was they were building a moon mission, uh, which is very similar to what Chandrayaan 2 was for ISRO. So it was a similar moon mission in that you had to build a spacecraft and which you would uh, uh, intend to land on the moon. Uh, and there would be a rover. Once the lander has successfully touched down, the rover would come out and try to explore the moon surface for science and stuff. Mm. And so that was basically the engineering challenge that uh, Team Indus uh, had started, uh, you know, uh, building on, uh, building for. And uh, so I was part of that effort initially via uh, writing blogs for them about the mission as to what, how, for, uh, tech, that would be technical blogs as to how, <clears throat> for example, you could take, uh, how is, how do you build the structure of such a lander? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, for example, if it has to touch down on the moon, then it would experience significant forces. So how do you need to build the structure? What material do you use? And what is the physics that goes into it and so on? And so that's one aspect. Then there's the other aspect as to how do you build the propulsion system for such a lander? What what kind of engines do you choose and so on? And uh, then there's the science aspect or what science do you do on the moon and so on? So I would write blogs about all these various technical and scientific aspects of the mission. Okay. That was one. The other thing I did was uh, completely different to this was uh, I was actually part of the technical team later on where since I was from a science background and other people were engineers there mm -hmm. so the idea was uh, since you know the moon is not like uh, not unlike the earth in the sense that uh, not all of the places on the moon are the same just like on earth you have Himalayas and Sahara which are two very different kind of landforms so geologically speaking so uh, just just like that on the moon you have different kinds of geological places so going to one place is totally not like going to the other place so uh -huh. the idea was if you are landing on the moon where you go and land is very important because that would decide what science you would do Gosh. so as a science as a person with a science background my job was to figure out uh, where on the moon did the science community want to go to maximize science and based on the engineering constraints that you have, you know, you can land only on these kinds of rocky areas, but not too rocky areas and so on and so forth. Uh, you can you cannot land on a, a place which is too inclined, otherwise the lander would just fall and things <laughs> like that. So there were all sorts of uh, major and minor engineering constraints. Got so it. take into account those constraints and take into account what the science community wanted to do yeah. and try to interface those two. 
interesting and find some sort of a ground so that was the uh, that was my work basically trying to find landing sites uh, of scientific interest which were engineering wise feasible very so, interesting yeah and i that was I feel, basically what i did very interesting i feel just like this take a pause yeah no problem just take a pause yeah yeah no problem no problem oh. Yeah, you'll be you'll be able to just drop that out later. No, that's okay, no, Justin. That's. Banawi rakum. Banawi. Yeah, sir. Ha. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so Justin, that's it's actually very interesting. You know, I feel like this is. Was this when Moon Monday actually started, Jatin? Because you you mentioned having these different places on the moon that would have been in of interest to the scientific community. But I feel like <clears throat> was this when you realized that the moon is so diverse in terms of what it has to offer, and we need to. I mean, personally, you would like to explore what each part has to offer. So, how did Moon Monday Absolutely. emerge from there? absolutely yeah so the original version of moon monday absolutely totally came out of here you are co correct on that so uh, since i was you know researching places on the moon anyway as part of my job uh, you know i was like okay let's blog about it as well you know uh, at least the scientific parts of it so uh, so that's where the idea came up from uh, came into be and uh, the other thing that was driving that was i was just fascinated by those geological landforms because for me it changed what the moon was uh, uh for all this time even though i've been saying that i've been interested in space exploration uh since i was uh, a child and so a student and so on and i studied physics for the most part of my life of studying and learning space exploration it was mostly about things beyond the moon not as much about the moon itself it. so when it came to the moon and when i started understanding more about the moon in particular uh i was just completely you know baffled and completely drawn to it because i did not think about the uh complexity that it has it is capable of and the big science questions that it can answer which i learned as part of that job and as part of uh learning about the moon uh, generally speaking mm. uh, later on so yeah so moon monday the original version of it absolutely came out of that yeah and was was this also when you got to see that uh, rocket launch uh um yeah so this no that was a bit later that was, uh, okay. that was in 2019 late okay. but yeah somewhat connected to that yeah okay but it's i mean that's interesting right how one particular object that you study in the solar system can give you so much information it's almost like a synecdoche right where when you find it's out insane. like one little property you get like an understanding of almost everything and that is what's so beautiful about mm -hmm. science right that you find right. something that's very elemental it can actually translate right. very easily and this is not right. something you see very easily in the social sciences because there is a lot of complexity with regards to how you can um take it the results of a study and translate it into a larger setting because humans are different right. in every setting right but in science if right. if you if you get as foundational as as you can you can actually prove something and then re replicate it in so many other settings right so that is what's really beautiful about and and that's something Absolutely. that and, and no, go ahead yeah i think you 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 spot on on that i mean it just uh in my, even in my recent learnings and writings about specific planets in the solar system and specific objects in the solar system Uh, i've just been you know constantly amazed by how sending just one mission to a particular object has completely transformed our understanding of not just that object but also the solar system at large sure and uh, will do so again if an if an object which has not been studied so far is sent a mission to so right. it's it's just baffling so there's so many unanswered questions we haven't figured out anything about the solar system yet so to speak it's 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 an, in the very early nascent stages of it that's so, interesting yeah. so i think a lot of our listeners are going to be those you know uh, space scientists and aeronautical engineers and space communicators just like you in the future awesome. you know jatin i'm just going to ask you 
one or two more questions and I don't want to take too much of your time, but I, I just want to know, like you, you started writing on blogger, then you moved to medium. And at the same time you were writing for a professional organization. How did you, uh, because I know you're doing this full time now, right? You are actually writing full time. So how did you move from medium to writing full time and where mm -hmm. did that money come from? Because I know, I mean, I'm, uh, I, 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 I really enjoy your writing. And this is something I want to push forward is that when you find a writer who's writing, you really admire, find a way to support them financially. And I'm glad you gave me that opportunity and I support your writing every month with, with a reasonable amount, but it's a small way to actually, you know, support writers that are doing good work, right? So can you just give us some insight into how from medium you moved on to writing independently mm -hmm. and maintaining your finances doing this? Right. Yeah, certainly. So the it was a slow, gradual process. Okay. Uh, so what I did was while I was working at Team Indus, mm. uh, I was continuing my own blog on the side, although uh, the frequency had decreased. So I was still writing on Medium on my own blog as well. Uh, but then what happened is in 2018, I uh, got to know about this conference in India, uh, in a city in India where it was a conference on science journalism and scientists. Mm. And the I went to that conference where many, and, and there many of the big shot science writers and many scientists who are interested in science communication were all gathered at one place. And it was like, you know, a festival of uh, science writing and sci science journalism in my head. And so I just went there out of interest, trying to know about what they wanted to uh, tell the world there, whoever, whoever was attending there. And so that is where I met uh, Mukund. He is the editor of the Wire Science, a popular publication in India. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so it's an internet media publication and it's very popular here. So I met the editor and I was just talking to him. I just, we chatted for like about five minutes or so. And um, <clears throat> uh, he asked me about my background, about my work. I asked about his, uh, and he got interested in what I had to offer. So I basically said that I would like to, I've been blogging amateur, you know, on an amateur basis and on a professional basis very recently. And I would love to write for a publication. Mm -hmm. So so he gave me the option to write for them. And we decided on a topic and it, I published my first article for a professional media publication uh, then. And nice. it was a paid piece. So it was a pro fully professionally done article. And uh, then I started doing articles regularly for them. So I wrote uh, about one article for them every month. Uh, and that was still freelancing. I mean, that was on the side while I uh, had my job at Team Indus. Okay. And uh, then I got published on the Planetary Society, where one of my articles was noticed by uh, Emily Lakrawala, who used to work uh, on at the Planetary Society at the time. Mm -hmm. And she's a very, very popular science communicator. And uh, so she noticed my article because I had tagged her on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of my articles, which I wrote was inspired by her article. So which is why I tagged her saying mm -hmm. that, you know, inspired by Emily Lakrawala's article. Uh, I have written this particular article on how uh, missions in space exploration have failed due to uh, failure in electronics that they carry. So she read that article and she found it very interesting and she liked it enough that she contacted me that she would like to republish it on the Planetary Society. So that's how, that's, uh, that's how the Planetary Society happened for the first time. And uh, then uh, I reached out to them a year later with another story mm -hmm. uh, for Apollo, uh, for science that we learned from Apollo, uh, from Apollo missions in particular. So the, uh, in particular, the origin of the moon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so they, uh, so they were happy to consider that story and I wrote for them again. And then I slowly realized that, oh, you know, I can actually do this for a living. Uh, I start, I started pitching articles to publications and, uh, I, then I slowly started writing more or less regularly for, uh, some of them. So that's when I left, uh, realized that I want to do science writing professionally uh, and I really enjoy uh, doing that. Mm. So so I thought, okay, let me quit my job and let me do this full time. So this was around late 2019 mm -hmm. when uh, I had been publishing for The Wire 
and I had one or two articles here and there on different publications, including the Planetary Society. Society. So I was like, okay, let's just uh, quit and let me do this full time. If I have all the time uh, that I don't have now, then I would be able to write more articles and approach more publications. So right. that's how it started. And uh, fast forward to now, I'm pretty much writing, you know, full time, uh, uh, doing science writing full time for publications. That's, that's and really doing more things of my own. That's interesting because you have multiple sources of income and because you've started writing for a global audience, you have consumers, I mean, people that want to read your work internationally as well, right, Jatin? That's interesting that the internet actually opened up your market in terms of who would want to read your work. And I think right. that, is, that is something that is important to note here is that you can use the internet as a tool. What, what I also got from that conversation, Jatin, is that you were able to tap into knowledge networks, whether it's the science conference, the science journalism conference, like you met Mukund there and that opened up this opportunity. Similarly, you used another network, which is Twitter, and you send that tweet out to this person, but you backed it up with some valuable data. And that's the thing, yeah. you know, when we reach out to a professional, we think that they just have to help us without us providing something valuable in return but you were able to write something building on her earlier piece, which opened up that connection. So that is actually really insightful. And I know like this is something I'd like to push forward and I wouldn't want you to, you know, like if you are interested in, you know, supporting Jatin as a freelance writer, uh, you can go to his blog, which I will link below and uh, you can support him on a website called Patreon, Patreon where you can contribute a, a small amount and, uh, that will help him continue writing uh, independently. And that's something I highly recommend you do, not just for Jatin, but for other freelance writers, because they spend a lot of time working on these pieces and it's important we remunerate them for that time. Jatin, thank you for your time. Just to close this interview, uh, can you give me one resource that, uh, you know, that'll get kids excited, students excited about science? I know you've given me one book, you've given me many books and many videos, but one book that you feel students should start off with to open up their horizons about you know the I, universe i would say rather than a uh, rather than a book i would say that you know since a lot of my learning has come from the internet and enabling of my profession and everything else as you said rightly so like internet has been the internet has been quintessential to everything i do and i've done so far sure. so i would say i would direct them to uh, planetary.org Okay. which is the Planetary Society's website. Okay. And they do a lot of interesting articles. Uh, they do a lot of things, but among that uh, is their work in uh, science outreach and exploration, particularly with space exploration. Sure. So the what they do is uh, they have a lot of articles where anyone with no assumed knowledge whatsoever can just come to their website and learn about how and why we explore uh, space. Right. and what are the big questions to answer and what have we learned so far and so on. So I would just direct them to, you know, planetary.org and then explore as they wish and as their curiosity leads them. And the other thing is, I mean, it's a very uh, dull suggestion, but it's a very valid one at the same time. Once you are hooked to space exploration, uh, there is nothing like Wikipedia to get you uh, to the next level because <laughs> It's, it's, it's boring, it's drab, you know, it has lots of passive voice sentences, it's clunky, but once you are interested, all of it doesn't matter. And uh, it will give you links to pretty much everything, to, this, uh, to articles, to uh, uh, original sources, to research papers and stuff. So I think that would be the level two. So if you're already interested in space exploration, just uh, start reading random Wikipedia pages. If you are uh, wanting to know more, uh, go to planetary.org and of course my blog. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jatin. This was so eye-opening and such a wonderful journey. I mean, just speaking to you uh, makes me want to go back to school and and uh, you know start off uh, learning science again. And actually, what you made me realize is that there's no age to learn science. We're all we can be scientists at whatever age and. I think I'm going to go and start looking at some of these resources. I've probably looked at some of them already, but maybe go back and try and become a little scientist myself. So thank you, awesome. Jatin. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. Awesome. And this is the end yeah, of our first you. episode of Learning Stories. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>